you have your Bibles, John 20, 24 through 31. But Thomas, called the twin, one of the twelve was not with them when Jesus came. And so the other disciples were telling him, we've seen the Lord. But he said to him, if I don't see the marks of the nails in his hands, put my finger into the mark of, his na- of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will never believe. A week later, his disciples were indoors again, and Thomas was with them. And even though the doors were locked, Jesus came, stood among them, and said, Peace be with you. And he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, and look at my hands. Reach out and put your hand and put it to my side. Don't be faithless, but believe. Thomas responded to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said, Because you've seen me, you've believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples that were not written in this book, but these were written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. So this morning, through this story, um, I'm going to do a little bit different in how I normally speak. I'm going to do more of a topical message this morning, but really focusing on this. But we're going to look at the topic of doubt. There are two types of people here this morning, those of you who've never doubted the truth of the scriptures. You've never wrestled with the question, did Jesus rise again? Was Jesus really a human? For you, it was a certain matter of faith. Even from a young age, you knew God was real. You knew Jesus was real. About you, Jesus said these words in this passage, blessed are you who've seen me, who haven't seen me, and yet you believe anyway. You're a blessed people because God has given you strong faith. But there's another category here this morning. We'll call you doubters. You have a questioning mind. You need to examine the evidence, the proof for the fact that Jesus is who he claims to be. You wonder, could this be true? Has Jesus really risen from the dead? Has he really conquered death? What what does that mean for me? Or is the claim that he rose from the dead just wishful thinking of a few men and women who were made unstable by the grief that they experienced over the loss of Jesus. Is the whole thing just a made-up fabric story, or is it true? It's my premise that most of us in this room probably fall into the second category. We have wrestled with this. We have questioned. Some of us are still questioning. We're occasional doubters. It catches us at odd moments and surprises us. Others of us are chronic doubters. We're always seeking the evidence. We're always wanting proof. We're always evaluating things. But not all of us have been given the privilege of believing without questioning. And it's that second group to most of us I want to talk to this morning. If you want a bad name, admit your doubts. Right? Look at Thomas, right? We read in our text today how he admits that he doubts the resurrection of Jesus. And for almost 2,000 years... We've been beating up Thomas every chance we get for honestly saying from his mouth, I won't believe unless I see the nail wounds in his hands. I won't put my fingers in him and place my hands in the wounds of his side. I want to do a few things from this passage this morning. I want to look at who this disciple is, and then we'll spend a little time... We'll spend a little time doing a character study on him, and then I want you to just notice a few things about doubt from this morning. Number one, Thomas was a twin. The Bible doesn't tell us a lot about Thomas. We don't know anything about where he comes from, what he did before he became a disciple. We don't know any of those facts, but we do have a little bit of a clue about his family. When you read about Thomas, he's usually introduced this way, Thomas, who is also called Didymus. Now that's not going to mean anything to us today, but the original readers immediately recognized what this was. The name Thomas comes from the Aramaic that means twin. And Didymus is the Greek word for twin. Thomas had a twin brother or a twin sister, and twin was his nickname. In the early church, there was speculation of who the twin was. Some think that it was Matthew, but no one knows for sure. Second thing I want you to know about Thomas, he professed enormous, possessed enormous courage. It's unfortunate that Thomas is remembered solely in a negative light. But there's more to this man than just a man who doubted. His first steps onto this stage in biblical history is John 11. Lazarus has died in Bethany, a suburb of Jerusalem. And Jesus and his disciples were on their way in the area of Jericho when they get the word that Jesus' friend Lazarus has died. 
And Jesus decides to go to Bethany. His disciples remind him that the last time you went near Jerusalem, they tried to kill you. It would be suicidal to go back, and Jesus decides to go anyway. And at that moment, Thomas speaks up for the first time that we know of, and he says, you know what, let's go also. Because if Jesus is going to die, we might as well die with him. A brief statement that reveals enormous courage. Thomas agreed that the Jewish leaders would probably kill Jesus if they went back. And events would prove him correct. But what can you say about a man who says, hey, if they kill him, they have to kill me as well. It takes a real man to say that. There's love there. There's loyalty there. There's despair there. There's sacrifice there. There's absolute total commitment there. It may be that Thomas just understood better than the other disciples what was about to happen. And that brief statement, if you think about it, may explain his later doubts. Third thing I want you to notice about Thomas is he didn't accept easy answers. The Gospel of John mentions Thomas one other time before the crucifixion. It's Thursday night before Jesus dies in the upper room. Jesus had just washed the feet of the disciples and he gives them the command to love one another. Judas leaves the room to go betray Jesus. The rest of the disciples crowd around Jesus knowing that the end was not far away. To them, these loyal men who had stood with him in the final hours of Jesus' trial, Jesus says these words, Do not let your heart be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it weren't so, I would, not have, to I would have told you so. But I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and I will take you with me that you will be where I am. You know the way to the place I'm going. And Thomas is sitting there listening intently, quietly, carefully. All this talk about coming and going gets too much for him. It seems vague. It seems mysterious. And in a moment of great honesty, he blurts out these words, says, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know that way? These are the words of a total honest man. The rest of the disciples are just as perplexed as Thomas is, but Thomas is the only one that speaks out. We all know people like that. If I don't understand, I'm going to ask a question. And they keep asking, and they keep asking, and they keep asking until it makes sense. And, the sec and that's the second key to Thomas' personality. He's an independent thinker. He's a thoughtful man. He's not easily stampeded and doesn't accept easy answers. He wouldn't make a confession of faith unless he deeply believed that this is true. Let others have an easy faith that comes with reflection and deep, without deep faith and without questioning, but not Thomas. His was a faith that was won through the agony of personal struggle and doubt. Thomas was also a man that was fully devoted to Jesus. The picture we have of Thomas on the eve of the crucifixion of this is this, that he's a brave man, deeply loyal, and deeply committed to Jesus. If need be, he's ready to lay down his own life for Jesus. He's no doubt inclined to look somewhat at the dark side of life. He's completely honest about his doubts, his confusions, his fears, and he will not be satisfied with second-hand answers. He wants to know himself. And that sets the stage for the greatest crisis in the life of Thomas. We tend to forget what it's like on Easter morning when the, for us, we rejoice in the resurrection, but Easter morning for the disciples was anything but a resurrection. It's worth asking the question, if we had been there, if we were with the disciples that morning, and Mary came in and said, Jesus is alive, would we have believed? Or would we have doubted? Or to put it another way, what would it take to convince you that someone that you loved came back to life after being dead for three days? Suppose it was a close family friend or a family member, and you saw them die. You saw them in the casket. What would it take to convince you? Is there any way that you would be convinced if someone told you? Rising from the dead is not a common thing. At best, it hasn't happened for centuries. If we had been there in Jerusalem with Matthew and James and John and Peter and the others, would we have believed the rumors that Sunday morning? And answering that question helps us remember two other facts about that scenario. Number one, none of the disciples believed at first either. Very simply, none of them were expecting a resurrection. Now it's true that Jesus in his teachings constantly spoke and talked about rising from the dead, but his followers didn't understand it. They didn't believe it. 
The resurrection was the furthest things from their minds that morning. Forget his predictions. Forget all the things he talked about. Forget all the brave talk. They had given up. Who was really expecting a resurrection that morning? Not the disciples. Remember, it was the Jewish leaders that said, Hey, we heard Jesus talk about this. Go make sure you put a uh, stone in front of the tomb and seal it and have soldiers in front of it. The enemies of Jesus feared that something would happen. But the friends of Jesus weren't expecting anything. And Thomas wasn't present that morning when Jesus showed up. John tells us that Thomas wasn't present on the Sunday evening when Jesus showed up in their midst. The Bible doesn't say why, but I think I know why. There are two different ways that people respond to tragedy, to, to sorrow. Some of you guys, when you're going through hardships, you want to be around other people. You want to have friends near you. You want to talk it through. You want others to hear you and help you process. But there are others of you who, when you're going through a hard time, you don't, the last thing you want is to be near people. You want to pull away. You want to retreat. You want to process by yourself. And I think that was Thomas. Thomas probably realized more than the others what was going on in Jerusalem. So it may be true that he was deeply hurt Maybe more than the other disciples. He was now with the other disciples probably because his heart was crushed at seeing his friend, the one that he had given his last three years of his life to, die. He gave his life for Jesus and Jesus still died. In a sense, Jesus failed him. And yet Thomas still loves. He still cares. He still wants to believe but his heart is broken. He's not a bad man. And his doubt isn't sinful. Deep inside, he wants to believe. And all of us have probably been in the same place before. See, most of us, one time or another, would doubt, like Thomas. Thomas's doubt is our doubt as well. Even the best person among us will occasionally feel the chill of doubt's shadow. It could be as you bury a loved one. And you wonder, is there really a resurrection? Will I see this person again? Is it real? It could be when you go through a hardship in life and you wonder, is God really with me? Is God really faithful? It could be as you try to share the gospel with someone and you say, is what I believe really right when they push back on you and question everything that you're saying? It could be as you hear someone debunk Christianity and your faith, but most of us, friends, will doubt from time to time. What does the Bible say about doubters? We need to understand three realities about doubt. Number one, your doubts are normal. One of the most frustrating things about doubting is to feel isolated. We're ashamed of our doubts. We feel that if we stand up and admit that we have doubts, we're going to make a name for ourselves. We feel like we're second-class citizens for doubting or questioning. And as a result, we keep our doubts to ourselves and we isolate ourselves. And yet when Jesus appeared to Thomas after he confessed his doubts, notice how Jesus responds. Did he criticize him? Did he put him down? Did he yell at him? Did he reject him? Did he scold him? Did he mock him? None of those things. He allowed Thomas to take the t very test that Thomas himself suggested. He said, you want to put your fingers on my hands? Here. Here are my hands. You want to put your hand into the wounds on my side? Here. Here's my side. Hey, Thomas, don't be faithless any longer. Believe. He opened his arms in love to Thomas, and Thomas believed, and he says these words, my Lord and my God. See, when you read the Bible, you discover that some of the greatest people, of the greatest servants of God had doubts. David in the Psalms would say things like, God, I don't know what's going on. Why are you allowing this? God, why do you allow bad things to happen to good people? Job says, God, are you sure you really love me? Are you sure you know what's going on? Are you sure you have the power to change the situation I'm in right now? Abraham, the father of our faith, didn't believe that he was going to be a father at the age of 90. 
Abraham doubted God's protection and told lies about his wife's identity. Moses doubted that God would provide food in the wilderness. Peter doubted that he could walk on water. The early church doubted that God would answer their prayers when they prayed for Peter to be delivered from prison. Friends, if you doubt, you're in good company. Jesus called John the Baptist the greatest man who ever lived, and yet John the Baptist was one who doubted. One time John was in prison and everything was going wrong and he was at the lowest point of his life and ministry and he sent some of his disciples to Jesus and said, was I wrong? Did I make a mistake? Are you really the Messiah? He had doubts. And Jesus doesn't ridicule or question or mock John in those moments. He sends his people back to John to reassure him. He didn't condemn him. He didn't criticize him. And Jesus turns around and says to the crowd, John the Baptist is the greatest man who's ever been born. Right after John expressed doubts about Jesus. Friends, many of God's greatest servants, many of the people that God has used in most powerful ways have doubted. You are probably going to doubt at least occasionally too. Your doubts are normal. Your questions are real. And that's the first reality about doubt that you need to understand. Number two, your doubts are unique. Your doubts are unique. One of the problems with doubt is we tend to lump all sorts of doubts together. We tend to think that if we doubt, we're throwing everything into question. We fail to realize that there are causes for doubt. The first type of doubt is caused by our conscience. And that's the hardening of our mind to truth. This type of doubt is sin. It is deliberate denial, disobedience, rebellion, resistance against God. It's always condemned in the Bible. 1 Peter 1 says, Cling right tightly to the faith that you have in Jesus and always keep your conscience clear. For some people have deliberately violated their conscience and as a result, their faith has been shipwrecked. And if your doubt is unbelief, you have a serious problem. Hebrews 12 verse 15 says, Look after each other so that none of you will miss out on the special favor of God. Watch out that no bitter root of unbelief, doubt, rises up among you, for whenever it springs up, many are corrupted by its poison. Your conscience will cause you to doubt. Critics will cause you to doubt. There are people that challenge us, that ridicule our beliefs. The Bible talks a lot about scoffers. Many of us have been in situations where our faith has been criticized, has been challenged. Sometimes even by people in the church. Critics cause us to doubt God. My friends, can I encourage you? You don't need to be afraid of critics. You don't even have to be afraid of asking intellectual questions. The Bible doesn't ask you to check your mind off and leave it at the door before you come in here. I think you'll find that the Bible makes the most sense when you look at the evidence. Don't be afraid to ask the tough questions. So encouraged by Pastor saying this morning. You can just simply accept the answers. He read through the Bible, and at the end of it came to the conclusion, Jesus is Lord and Savior. Wrestle with it. The third type of doubt is caused by your circumstances. Sometimes it's hard to make faith fit with the painful realities of life. Sometimes life causes us to question. Sometimes life causes us to crush our faith. For most of us, there's a large gap between what we expect God to do in our lives and what we actually experience. We expect God to always show up and just bless us because we're following him and all of a sudden our experiences are we're going through hardships, we're going through difficulties, we're going through pain, we're going through challenges and we're saying, but God, I followed you, but God, I serve you, why am I doing this? Why am I going through this? And as a result, doubt begins to enter into your minds about what you've been taught to believe. Circumstances will cause you to doubt God. When your prayers are unanswered, when tragedy strikes, when you're faced with an impossible situation that you cannot provide the answer for. Jesus was on the lake of Galilee with his disciples. He's asleep in the bottom of the boat and the storm comes up. And in Mark 4, the story says that the storm came up, it was great winds, and it was in an intense storm, and the disciples wake Jesus up. Literally, they shake Jesus and say to him, Jesus, don't you care if we drown? You know, that's a typical reaction when we're under pressure. Don't you care, God? Don't you care that my life is going, you know, in a way that I don't want it to go? Don't you care that I'm facing difficulties and hardships? 
And Jesus gets up and he calms the storms. And that story is a great example that we'll go through storms even when Jesus is on the boat with us. Jesus never promised that storms and trials and tribulations and hardships will be absent from our lives. But he did make another promise. He said, I will never leave you or forsake you. That no matter how hard your situation is, no matter how hard the circumstances is, Jesus is right there on the boat with you. Critics may cause you to doubt, or your conscience may cause you to doubt, circumstances may cause you to doubt. Your doubts are not only normal, your doubts are also unique. The third thing, your doubts are an opportunity. You know, the strongest faith comes out of the struggles with your doubt. You know, when we see doubters, we tend to put them down. We tend to think that they're just religious weaklings, that they should get their act together and they should know. But I've discovered, and some of you guys are witnesses of this, that those of you guys who wrestle with your doubts often come out to be the strongest in your faith. Because you don't just simply accept stuff that your parents told you or your friends told you. You have wrestled through it and worked through it. Now it's become your faith. And it's hard to take away your faith. It's hard to, it's easy for people to question the faith that your fathers have or your mothers have if you don't own it yourself and cause you to doubt. But when you wrestle through that, it becomes your faith and you become incredibly useful for the kingdom of God. Thomas's doubts were an opportunity for him. When he eventually saw Jesus, his doubts were answered. But he didn't just walk away saying, all right, now I believe, I'm just going to continue on with my life. He says, my Lord, my God. His heart was changed. His doubts ultimately led him to belief in Jesus. Lee Strobel is the author of a book called The Case for Christ. And before coming to Jesus, Lee Strobel was an avowed atheist. He was a journalist, and he, he thought there was far more evidence that God was merely a product of wishful thinking. How could a loving God, how could there be a loving God if there's so much evil in the world? How can we call God a loving if he will send people to hell for not believing him? How could miracles violate the laws of nature? What about evolution? Doesn't science disapprove all the supernatural things that the Bible talks about? Eventually, Lee's wife becomes a Christian. And so, in his anger toward her, he begins a quest to discover whether or not the Bible is true or not. And as a journalist and a lawyer, he set out to ask the tough questions. In November 8, 1981, two years after beginning his research, he pulled out a legal pad and began to list all the questions and answers that he had come up with. And he concluded, and these are his words, I was ambushed by the amount and, about the amount and quality of the evidence that Jesus is the Son of God. And as I sat at my desk that Sunday, Saturday afternoon, I shook my head in amazement. I have seen defendants carted off into the death chambers with far less convincing proof. And in the face of the overwhelming avalanche of the evidence for the case of Christ, the great irony is this. It will take more faith for me to believe my atheism than to trust in Jesus. And sitting at his desk, legal pad in front of him, Lee took the next step of committing his life to Jesus. And on November 8, 1981, he turned from being a skeptic to a committed follower of Jesus. His doubts ultimately led him to Jesus. Friends, your doubts are normal. Your doubts are unique. Your doubts can be used as an opportunity to be used by God in powerful ways. They can bring you closer to God rather than driving you away from God. But how do you deal with these questions? How do you keep your doubts from defeating you? Let me give you just three suggestions. Number one, admit your doubts. Admit your doubts. Be honest. Say, I have doubts. You can't overcome until you recognize them. So many people I know who are Christians are intimidated by their doubts. A, di a doubt comes up, starts to creep into their mind, and they begin thinking, oh no, I may not be a Christian anymore because I'm asking these questions. Maybe God doesn't love me because I have these doubts. They can't even face the fact that they have some legitimate, honest questions. Friends, the point is that not even your doubts can stop God from loving you. Even if you doubt him, he still loves you. And that's what the story of Thomas is all about. Listen to, listen to this. Honest doubt is better than dishonest faith. 
Honest doubt is better than dishonest faith. God is big enough for you to ask him tough questions. God isn't tr- threatened by an honest examination of the facts of his word. Admit your doubts. Recognize that doubts are not bad in and of themselves. Ask God to help you with those doubts. Jude 1, and this should be an encouragement for all of us, says, show mercy to those whose faith are wavering. Don't condemn them. Don't call them heretics. Don't put them down. Don't say that they have weak faith. Don't tell them they need to have more faith. Show mercy to those whose faith is wavering. Show mercy to those who are wondering if God loves them right now. Show mercy to those who are wondering if Jesus is real. See, I think the world is looking for a church in which we are free to ask questions. Free to not automatically accept everything that's said. They're looking for a place where they can doubt and wrestle with the issues. Some of you guys have been doubting for weeks or months or even years with us as a church. And that's okay. You're still here. You're still wrestling. You're still questioning. Keep doing it. Because one day, I truly believe God will show up. But when that happens, your faith will be much stronger than you just simply accepting everything I say from up here without doubting or without asking questions. Keep wrestling through it. The sin isn't in doubt if doubt leads to questions and your doubt leads to your questions lead to answers and you accept the answers that God gives you, then doubt has done the good work in your life. Do you ever have doubts? Congratulations. You're human. And you're in a good place. Because right around you, there are probably other people who have also asked questions. And you're in a place where you need to be. You're in a good club. But how do you keep those doubts from defeating you? Admit your doubts. Second thing, doubt your doubts. <laughs> doubt your doubts. You know, we do the exact opposite. We doubt our beliefs, but we believe our doubts. And that doesn't make sense. What we need to do is we need to believe our beliefs, and we need to doubt our doubts. Solomon said in Proverbs 3, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. There comes a time where you have to doubt your doubts. Jesus said here, blessed are those who haven't seen me and believe anyway. What do you listen to the most? Do you listen to the word of God and what it says about you in your life? Or do you listen to your feelings? So your feelings will go all over the place based on how you're doing that day. Someday your feelings will tell you that you're unloved. Someday your feelings will tell you that I don't feel God in my life. Some days your feelings will tell you that God doesn't have a plan for me. Some days your feelings will tell you that I've done too much sin, that God will not accept me. Some days that your feelings will tell you that no one will love you. Do you listen to the word of God? Or do you listen to your feelings? Because the word of God says, you are intimately loved more than anyone could ever dream or imagine. The word of God says that he will never leave you or forsake you. The Word of God says that He has ordered steps, that He is ordering the steps in your life, that He has a plan and purpose for you. The Word of God says that a hair of your head will fall without Jesus knowing. If not one piece of this hair will fall, He will know every detail of my life. The Word of God says that I, I am safe and secure in the palm of God's hand, that there is no devil in hell that can separate me from the love of Jesus. Do you believe your feelings or do you believe your doubts? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your understanding. Doubt your doubts. Hebrews 11 says, Without faith it's impossible to please God. For the one who draws near to God must believe that he exists and he rewards those who seek him. See, if you begin to seek God, if you begin to ask the tough questions, God says, I will reward your quest. Doubt your doubts. And finally, begin with the faith you already have. Begin with the faith you already have. It may be just a little bit, but begin with the faith that you already have. The story in Mark 9 is a beautiful story. A man comes to Jesus with his sick son, and Jesus looks at him and says, I can heal him if you believe that I will heal him. And this is the classic statement that the man made. Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. Have you ever felt like that? 
that you're filled with faith and doubt at the same time? That you can have faith that God wants you to do something and at the same time you could be scared to death at what God wants you to do? Friends, courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is you going ahead and doing it in spite of your fear. You can have faith and doubt at the same time. This man was filled with faith and doubt, and yet in spite of his honest doubts, he went ahead to Jesus, and Jesus did a miracle. Jesus healed his son. Listen, no matter how weak or how frail you think your faith is, it's enough. Tim Keller uses this analogy that I love, and I've shared this many times here. But he says, imagine that you're on a high cliff, and you're climbing this cliff, and you lose your footing, and you're about to fall. And just beside you, as you're falling, is this branch that's sticking out at the very edge of the cliff. It is the only hope that you have, and it's more than strong enough to support your weight, and you can hold on to it. But how is that branch going to save you? If in your mind it's filled with intellectual certainty that the branch can support you, but you don't grab onto it, you're going to die. You will die. But if you doubt that the branch is going to hold you, if you think the branch is going to fail, but you still cling on to it, you will be saved. Why? Because it's not in the strength of your faith. It's the object of your faith that saves you. It's the object of your faith. Strong faith in a weak branch is fatally inferior to weak faith in a strong branch. Friends, Jesus is the branch that will never break. He is strong enough to hold all your doubts. He is strong enough to hold all your questions. He is strong enough to hold all your fears. He is strong enough to hold all your uncertainty. Would you reach out to that branch today? I read a testimony of a young man who said, in, in, and after he came to Jesus, he said, why didn't someone tell me that I could become a Christian and work on all my doubts afterwards? You can be a follower of Jesus and wrestle through some doubts this morning. Every little step that you're moving toward Christ moves you further away from doubt and discouragement and depression and despair. And when Jesus saw Thomas, he said something to him that I believe he's saying to each of us today. Stop doubting. Believe. Stop doubting. Believe. There's a time to doubt, but there's a time to start doubting. To simply say to God and say, God, I don't understand everything, but I believe. I believe you love me. I believe you saved me. I'll still wrestle through all the questions I have, but I know that I'm yours and you're mine. And so I'm going to trust you. That I don't know how tomorrow's going to turn out, but I'm going to trust you. I don't know what, how everything is going to fall into place, but I'm going to trust you. I don't have all the answers to all the skeptics that are questioning me, but I'm going to trust you. What was it that turned Thomas the doubter, the skeptic, into a believer? It was a personal encounter with Jesus. Friends, if you've never had that, regardless of your religious background, whether you've been in church your entire life or not, you need that. You need to meet Jesus personally. What do you say to him? You say, Lord, I want to believe. Help me with my unbelief. Help me. I'm struggling. I'm doubting. I'm questioning. And friends, that's more than enough. Jesus healed the son of a man even when he made that very statement. Lord, I want to believe in you. Help my unbelief. That's more than enough. Some of you this morning are struggling with your doubts. Maybe you're wondering, I don't know if I can believe in God. I don't think I'm good enough. I don't think I'm righteous enough. How could God love me? Maybe you've thought, maybe I couldn't hold out. Maybe I won't be able to hold out as a Christian. I'm going to quit eventually. If I've committed my life and I can't hold out, then I'm going to embarrass myself and it's going to look bad. But deep down inside your heart, there's a little bit of faith. Just a little bit. And like a seed, it's beginning to grow in your life. You're beginning to notice the difference in your life and in the lives of those around you. You can't ignore it. Today is your day. You can let that little seed, small as a mustard seed, flourish and sprout and blossom 
or would you put your faith in what you can accept? See, that's much more important than any doubts that you have about things that you have to understand. I invite you, I challenge you, I encourage you this morning, take that first step today. You don't need to doubt the future or doubt God's love or doubt the uncertainties of life. You can face them in confidence. The history of the Bible, the heroes of our faith, the story of Scripture is that God takes doubters like you and I and he turns them into believers. And he not only does he turn them into believers, but then they become heroes of our faith. He can use you. He can use your doubts. People like Abraham and Job and David and Paul and Thomas. This morning we're about to enter into a time of communion. Before us we have the bread and the juice. The bread represents the very body of Jesus that was broken, wounded, pierced. The very body that Thomas doubted. The very body that ultimately saved Thomas, saved you, saved me. The juice represents the blood that was spilled, blood that still has the power to save, transform doubters in this room today. And we've heard a testimony of how God is still saving today. If you're here today and you're facing doubts, and you want someone to pray with you in the back, they're going to be Sean and Aaron, and they would love to pray with you. I invite you to sneak back there, pray with them, let them encourage you this morning, let them pray God's blessings over you this morning. If you need prayer for anything this morning, they're available back there, go back there, pray with them. For the rest of you, would you take a moment, would you meditate on the word this morning, would you pause, would you wrestle with your doubts, would you bring your doubts to Jesus? Would you let him remind you of his love and kindness and mercies in your life. And then when you're ready this morning, the way we do communion here, we do communion every week. It's a reminder to us that without Jesus, none of this would matter. If Jesus hasn't saved us, if Jesus didn't die for us, we're just a big social gathering. But what makes us family, what makes us redeemed and saved is the fact that Jesus died for us and resurrected from the dead for us. And so we remember this table every week as a reminder to say, it's not about us and how well we performed, it's about Jesus and what he has done. And so would you take a moment and meditate on the cross? Would you meditate on the love of Jesus for you? Don't meditate on the love of Jesus for the world, would you meditate on the love of Jesus for you? And then when you're ready this morning, I invite you to come forward, grab the elements, and you can take the elements back to your seat and take communion. Um, at your seats. But would you just spend some time in prayer before you come and let's celebrate what God has done together. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that in spite of our circumstances and in spite of our conscience and our critics, that we today, we can come to you. Thank you that you understand us completely, that you are not intimidated by our questions or our doubts or our fears. Thank you that the object of our faith is more important than the strength of our faith. Would you this morning help us to admit our doubts so that we can get them out in the open and struggle with them and overcome them? Help us to doubt our doubts, to believe our beliefs. Help us to begin with the faith that we have and just trust you. Help us to realize that it just takes a little bit of faith and that you could do great things when we put it into the hands of a great God. We pray this in the name of Jesus, who has redeemed us and rescued us. In Jesus' name, amen.